The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. And welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. Today, we have an interview with a gentleman named Stephen Donnelly. Not only is Stephen Donnelly a former addict, but after six years of arduous study, he was ordained a Roman Catholic priest and spent two decades as a spiritual leader and beloved priest. He celebrated 18 years of sobriety and is active in Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program, inspiring others to live a sober life. Without further ado, let's talk to Stephen Donnelly. Stephen Donnelly, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast today and share your story with us. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. I know, and I said this in your bio, that you you know, you know, were a priest, and we'll definitely talk about that. But how did, since this is a podcast about addiction, when did your road to addiction start with drugs or alcohol? It's both. Uh, I started drinking when I was about 14 years old and drank for a number of years. I played sports. So, of course, the drinking was um, at the end of a sporting event or a game. And then I started smoking marijuana in high school. And it was when I was 21 years old in 1976. I went out to visit my cousin in California, or my aunt, uncle and cousins in California. And I was introduced to cocaine um, in 1976. Stephen, what, what sport did you play in high school? Uh, basketball, baseball, and football. Okay. And yeah. so then when you went out to California to visit relatives and you were introduced to cocaine, how old were you then? 21. Okay. And I started using cocaine recreationally. I continued to drink, of course, and in the beginning, it was a small amount of cocaine, weekend warrior. I may go a couple of weeks without it, maybe even a month without it, but then I would use it. And of course, anything I bought was consumed that same day. Uh, there was no saving it and keeping some in reserve. And it just kept escalating, escalating. There was a uh, slower period of my uh, cocaine abuse in the 90s, uh, the early 90s. I entered the seminary and for six years I was studying to become a Catholic priest. And then it was probably monthly. Uh, I was just very engrossed in my studies. And then my real powerful cocaine addiction went from 1997 to 2000 because um, I, A, I had more money than I needed. And of course, I would buy cocaine on a weekly basis, then it got to be uh, every other day. And in probably 1998, I was using cocaine every day, depleted my bank account, went into credit cards, and I began to steal money to support my habit. Uh, and then in 2000, it was 24 seven, if I didn't have it, how I was going to get the cocaine, uh, using it, the, the lies, the manipulation, and all the things that factored in. You were using cocaine, but kind of had it under control when you went to seminary school. Yes. And what what was your motivation to become a priest? What what was it you wanted to do? I, I was in my mid-30s when I got the call from God. Some people had suggested it to me. Here in the Diocese of Rockville Center, there was a program entitled Call by Name, where somebody put my name in uh, to, for a possible candidate for a religious life. And then I went through the application process, the interviews, psychological review, academics. And um, when I entered the seminary in September of 1991, I really believe this is, this is what I want. Uh, I had been in retail management previously but this was God calling me, and I believed in my heart of hearts that I could be a very good priest. Um, and I believe I was it, during my ministry, uh, of course, more so after I stopped using cocaine than while I was using cocaine. Yeah. Right. So when you, when you entered the priest, uh, when, is it ordained 
as a priest? Is that the right word? Yes, I was okay. ordained a priest in uh, June, on June 14th, 1997. 1997. So the following year was when you said that your cocaine use really escalated. And I understand that you had more money. But what was going on that would make you want to escalate your drug use? Did something happen? I was living a didactic life. I was involved in a relationship and wasn't keeping my uh, my vows, uh, uh, struggling with my vows uh, of, of celibacy. Okay, okay. You know, I want to just I want to just tell you that your intention to help people, I think, is a very good thing, and I I can imagine that you did help a lot of people and continue to do that. So. Well done on going down that road, and I can understand how some of the vows that you are required to keep might be a challenge. Yeah, they were a challenge to, uh, to me, and I think because I broke that vow, it was the guilt and the shame, and the more guilt and shame that I had, the more that I would resort to numbing my feelings putting it to the side, sweeping it away, all the common cures that uh, most addicts, I'm only speaking in the first person today, but that many uh, I had uh, and escaped from those feelings of guilt and shame. Yes, and I, I think that guilt is big pretty much across the boards with with someone who's been addicted because typically – just aside from the drugs, there are various aspects of a person's moral code that I think oftentimes get violated when someone is addicted to drugs. And so I think I think I can see how guilt would definitely play into that. So how did it end? I mean, your your it priest... ended is what happened is the last, you know, it always seems when I listen to other addicts and alcoholics share their story. It always seems it comes to a rock bottom uh, and they, they hit the point of no return. They hit the dead end. They hit the, the they uh, go off the tracks, uh, they go, you know, disconnect from the third rail. So my last cocaine use would it be in April of 2001. Okay. So you went to rehab, reverted alcohol and drugs. How, how did you finally get? sober because i know you've been clean and sober for 18 years so yes, how did you finally right. get there i uh, after that uh, coming up dirty on the urine test and i continued to drink and i had got had to go back to rehab uh for 30 days this time in, in june of 2001 and i never had embraced my first time around i'd never embraced the program I wasn't doing the 90 and 90 sponsor, home group, commitment, support group, the things that are suggested. And after a while I began to drink, my bottom, my absolute bottom came on September 10th, 2002. I had been invited to go back up to this facility to do a memorial service for the one year anniversary of the horrific events of 9-11, uh, 2001. That afternoon, before heading upstate, I stopped at a liquor store, picked up a bottle of Chardonnay because wine doesn't smell, unbeknownst to me. I found out uh, soon afterwards that it does. And it was that evening. I got up to the rehab. I checked in, tried to, you know, not talk as little as possible, went to my room, and uh, 15 minutes later, Two gentlemen, two counselors from the facility came to the room and they gave me a breathalyzer and I had blown a 15. And it was that moment that I raised my hands up and I said, I surrender. I put the white flag in the air and I said, I cannot do this anymore. I had never said that. I, I believe that, you know, even with the cocaine, it, I just knew how much wreckage it did in my life. And I didn't think that the alcohol had done that wreckage, but in hindsight, it certainly did just as much as the cocaine abuse. And, and that was that was my moment. That was my moment that night. And I, I, I cannot say that I 
got down on my knees and said, I will never do this again. But I knew at that time I needed, uh, I needed to take this seriously and I needed to follow the suggestions that have been laid out for me. And I've done that. Um, Stephen, I, what were some of the, sorry to interrupt, what were some of the things that you did differently after having that realization with your rehab? What were some of the things you changed? I started to attend 12 step meetings on a regular basis. I started to speak to people about it. I started to get honest. I, I could not be honest. During the throes of my addiction, I, I, I'd lie about the day of the week. I could lie about watching a baseball game that I did not. I'd lie about anything. So it was the honesty to get honest, to speak to other people about my struggles. Uh, for, for many years, people would say, how are you? I'd say, I'm great. I'm fine. And I wasn't. I had so much stuff inside of me because of my childhood, coming from a dysfunctional family, a, a divorce, a, and different things that had happened. And when I was able to address them, when I was able to speak to another human being about those things, and then to get into, on a serious level, the 12 steps of, uh, uh, of any type of treatment program, to admit that I was powerless, to come to believe. Now, for somebody who worked as a Catholic priest, God was not an issue. I didn't have to come to believe. I had come to believe when I was three years old. But to turn my life, the third step of any 12-step program, to turn my life and my will over the care of God, because I wanted to run the show. I was the pilot. I drove the car. I was in charge. I wasn't in charge of anybody at all. And I realized that. And, and to work with another human being on those 12 steps, to take a searching and fearless moral inventory, and to see my faults and then try to work on them, character defects, shortcomings, who did I need to make amends to? And then after going through those first nine steps, then the, 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 the steps that we need each and every day, the 10th and 11th and 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I'm wrong, promptly admit it, to had, did strengthen, to strengthen my relationship with God through prayer and meditation. And I'd like to say as a result of having worked these steps to bring this into every area of my life. And, and that's why I am today, bringing it into every area of my life um, one day at a time. Well, and very well done for 18 years. I mean, very well done. It's it that's a huge accomplishment and um you've obviously put in the work you know i've heard from many different former addicts that it's work you have to you have to work at it to stay clean and sober so you were still a priest at the time yes what, i was what I, happened I was to... a priest they took me back uh we talk about forgiveness they forgave me and i i stayed as a priest for a couple of years and then i took a leave of absence i i had a uh county job, uh, worked for the government. And in 2010, I came, uh, I, I requested, I spoke to the bishop, and I requested a return uh, to priesthood. And after some deliberation, I started that process about 18 months earlier. And after some deliber deliberation, the bishop uh, invited me to come back to ministry after a little bit of a leave of absence. And that's when I think I, I really shined as A, a human being, B, a priest, and C, a person recovery. And we could reverse and invert those ABCs any way we'd like. But um, from 2010 to 2017, I was at a parish in Huntington, New York, and I got, I was very involved in 12 step work, but I presided at 10 or 11 overdoses, and I wanted to do more than just have a, a funeral mass and bury another victim of this horrific uh, disease and plague that we have with opioid addiction. And we had a night uh, called Fallen on Long Island, where uh, we had different representatives of 12-step uh, programs. We had the parents of victims of overdoses people from different forums, and we had 700 people come to the church that Friday evening. We ended with a candlelight uh, candlelight vigil around uh, the community, 
to get the awareness out. And, and that's a big part of what I do today is, is the awareness of where this addiction can lead to jails, institutions or death. Understood. Yeah. That, I mean, that's really you got two choices when you're an addict. You're either going to get clean and sober or you're going to jail or you're going to die or a combination yeah. thereof. Are you are you still a, an, an actual priest, Stephen? No. What ha I, I'm uh, suspended right now. What happened in 2018 is a woman had made allegations against me of a boundary violation. Uh, she had written a letter to the diocese and made these claims. And I was uh, sent away to a uh, psychological facility for clergy, for the priest religions in Pennsylvania, and uh, was there for two months under psychological uh, counseling review. And um, I still remember the day, July 26th, when I was called into the chancery, called in to speak to the bishop. And it was the lowest in all my years of recovery, it was the lowest I felt about how, you know, my, my, my legs had been cut out from underneath me on frivolous claims and leaving that the chancery office that afternoon, the thought of a drink or a drug was not there. Uh, I would think that my sobriety, my recovery is very strong. And when I returned to the rectory, a gentleman who I helped get sober, and he just celebrated three years, he was the, the, uh, the chef in it. And he came out, I was outside stewing around, and he came outside and he said to me, Stephen, I'd like to ask you two questions. And I said, okay. He says, do you have a life-threatening illness? And I said, no. He says, are you in trouble with the police? I said, no. So he says, so what the F is wrong? And, <laughs> and it was a simple statement. He had gone through something when he was on the police force. And I thought about it. it is, as long as I maintain my sobriety, all will be well. And, and through this time, I... Um, maintain my sobriety with the grace of God and the help of 12 step people. And, and I, I think that's phenomenal. And I, I, you know, I validated you for your 18 years clean and sober, but to go through an experience like that and not turn back to drugs and alcohol. I mean, that's huge, Stephen. I mean, I mean, that's huge. I mean, talk about testing your resolve to be sober. Uh, I, I can't, yeah, I can't think of anything, anything worse, really. No, um, it, it was, it was a bottom of recovery, but I realized that a drink or a drug would do nothing to advance me and it would lead me down that spiral staircase to hell. And, and I, I don't want to go back there. I live this program one day at a time. And, and as long as I didn't pick up that day, I was okay in every day since. Uh, I think I think that's But there's huge. a blessing. A yep. blessing came out of that. Okay. Uh, be, because after I was home, I can return to Long Island, and a, a dear friend of mine, many friends called me up to, in support, uh, but a dear friend of mine who I had uh, met in 2010, 2011, uh, Diane O'Brien, called me, and her first question was, how are you? And I said, thank you. I said, I'm fine. And, and she says, well, thank God for that. And she says, there's rumors floating around about different things. And but I, 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 you know, happy that you're OK. And she said to me, I have a question for you. And Diane asked me, um, she said, you are the most compelling person that I've ever met. Diane knew a lot of my story. I unfortunately in 2011. She lost her stepdaughter in a tragic accident, and I was able to help the family through that time. And uh, the, the years afterwards, uh, her husband and, and Diane would come to the uh, masses that I was celebrating when I was transferred. They came to the other church, and we would have dinner. And she says, I'd love to write a book about you. Hmm. And I, I looked at her. Well, I think it was via an email, but like, who, me? What? And um, so we began to write a book. Uh, and we, we spent many hours in, um, interviews talking about my story, uh, from childhood through business, through 
priesthood to the point where I was. And uh, it's a wonderful book. Diana's done a wonderful job with it. And it's a story of addiction. It's a story of falling down. It's a story of getting back up. The trials and tribulations. Um, I do know people who've done this one time, went to rehab and have remained clean and sober for years. Um, I can't say that I did. I, I had to go back to the rodeo a couple of times, but it's a story of where I was, where I am, and where I hope to be. And it's a story that for any person in addiction, whatever the addiction may be, it is hope. Hope is such an important word. And I've received the promises, the, the blessings of recovery, and I wanted to share those with others. I can't thank you enough for doing that because that's the whole point of this podcast is we know that there are people out there suffering, whether they are addicted or whether they have a loved one who's addicted. And I think that so often you get to that point where you think there's no hope. What do I do? And there, there is hope. And whether it's hope listening to your story or hope reading your book, you know, it's there. 